All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, today, uh, we have uh, Vinija Jain with us. Uh, she um, has uh, her early work on NLP at Oracle and has done work on recommender systems at Amazon, um, which I believe she is primarily associated with now. Um, uh, and and um, she has also been collaborating with some of you guys, some of us in um, the AI Institute at South Kelna. Um, her last work um, was on the AI generated text detection paper at EMNLP, which um, in which he, she collaborated, and that that is the paper that got um, uh, the outstanding paper award. So we are delighted to have Vinija here. Vinija has taken up a very um, broad uh, but important topic, and um, uh, many uh, you know many of us will get. Um, I, I suppose a very strong, you know, good overview of uh, LLM uh, as the talk is titled LLM Journey. Thank you, Vinija, very much for joining. It's up to you now. Take over. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Shaith, and glad to be here. Um, let me share my screen first. So let's see. Yeah. Let me go in slideshow. Is my screen visible? Perfect. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, thank you folks. Um, and thank you, Dr. Shade, for that introduction. Um, like Dr. Shade mentioned, I will be talking about the general LLM journey from where it started, where we are now, um, the background, just because it's kind of become the fundamental aspect behind NLP currently. The kind of tasks we're seeing coming out of from LLMs, from Indic LLMs, medical domain, it has become the backbone of NLP. So it's a very fundamental topic at this point. Um, so that's that's the reason I'm looking to cover this. And feel free to interrupt me at any point with any questions that you may have. All right. So the general overview of the entire LLM pipeline as we see it today is what I'm looking to cover. So this is kind of what our talk is going to be around. Um, so how do you interact with any LLM think chat GPT? Um, the way you interact with it is through prompting, right? And there are several prompt engineering techniques that we will look into and we will talk about. Then let's get into the architecture itself of the LLM. Um, it's the transformer architecture. It you know takes the input, um, generates an output. And the other things you can do on top of this LLM is do a lot of fine tuning for different tasks. Um, can also do parameter efficient fine tuning. Um, there's a lot, a lot of parameter efficient fine tuning techniques that have been recently um, introduced as well, and we'll talk about that. And the output, how does it generate an output through token sampling? So we'll look at those aspects as well. All right. So just a quick general overview of um, what I really mean with large language models here. So these are the generative AI models, which you know generally means they're unlike the encoder models that are looking to generate embeddings, these are actually looking to generate texts. And the way they work is um, they're trained on next um, token prediction. So, sorry. Okay. Um, so no, they're- sorry. Okay. So they're looking to actually predict the next token um, based on the token they currently are looking at. And the way they do it is that there's a, token sampling techniques, statistic probability of the highest likelihood of what the next word should be. Um, and what are they used for? They can be used for many tasks, um, translation, question answering, code completion we're seeing currently, um, text classifications. And so what are the benefits of using LLMs um, over the prior techniques that we had? LLMs have multilingual capabilities. If you, um, we've tested this out with ChatGPT. If you ask it questions just within the English alphabet in say Hindi or Punjabi, it's able to actually respond. Um, so they've been trained on a multilingual context. They are also able to maintain context over longer text spans. And this is the way the attention mechanism works within the transformers. Um, which is why they're able to do that. And the other um, 
biggest benefit here is that they're very interactive. Unlike prior models, um, unlike even the encoder models, you're able to kind of give feedback. If you didn't like the question, uh, the answer it gave, it, if you didn't like the output, you're able to interact and have that conversation with the model to get to the output that you really needed. Um, and just wanted to also introduce the open LLM leaderboard from Hugging Face. When you're on your journey and you want to figure out which model to use, the leaderboard um, is really helpful in kind of leveraging that. And like we mentioned already, what are some of the real world problems um, LLMs are really looking to solve? So they enhance communication, right? They're able to translate languages, um, generate and summarize content. So one of the research projects we've been working on um, that I've been working on have been more so related to um, Indic medical LLMs. And what we're looking to do is currently in medicine, a lot of the LLMs are mostly centered around English. So we're looking to take that and translate it, enhance communication to serve more rural um, communities within India. So I'm um, trying to help it, uh, trying to have it aid doctors in coming to a diagnosis and trying to kind of um, help the medical field in that sense. And that can all be done due to its enhanced communication abilities. Um, it improves customer service even applications. So it can handle inquiries and provide information around the clock, which is um, better for businesses in terms of customer service and you can fine tune it on your um, specific product data. So if you have manuals, um, if you have like, for example, if you run a car company and you have a manual with all of the details of the car components and someone has a question, they can just quickly ask and get a response rather than waiting on customer service for a long time. Education, of course, content creation, healthcare, data analysis, all great areas where this can be leveraged. And just quickly also wanted to um, briefly touch on the architecture before we dive even deeper. So we've all seen this image, right? Um, but just wanted to kind of identify the key differences between the encoder and the decoder. And furthermore, we'll kind of figure out um, when to use which one and which one is great for which tasks specifically. So they start off with kind of a similar architecture. They both take in embeddings as an input. They both have positional encoding. Um, positional encoding is the piece that we um, manipulate in order to extend context, context length within the LLMs. And we'll get to that soon too. And then we have the multi-headed attention. This is, um, so the encoder only has multi-headed attention, which is made up of uh, query, values, and keys. And you can kind of think of it analogous to, um, say, a library. So you go into a library because you have a question. That's your query. That's what's coming into the models. And now, um, how do you kind of find the solution to your query that you have? So you'll look at all of the book's titles. That's the key here. That's like the uh, what we're looking for that is highly correlated to the query we had. And once we find a book that correlates so closely to the query we have, and we start opening it and reading through it, that's the value, that's the answer that we've been looking for. So those are the um, multi-headed attention that exist both in encoder and in the decoder. Now, the key difference here is that the decoder also has a mass multi-headed attention. Um, the way this is different is it takes actually, um, so it takes in the query, as the input, but it takes the key and the value from the encoder itself. Um, and that's, of course, only happens when you use both the encoder and decoder together. And the other key difference here is the output. At the decoder, we actually can add a linear layer and then a softmax layer, and then it will output the probabilities of which token should appear next as it's trained on next token prediction. What the encoder does is it doesn't inherently have an output, but you can also add linear layers here and output embeddings. Um, so in that sense, the encoder is great for a closed book task, um, for a kind of understanding rich task. So uh, say you have 
something where you're just looking to kind of understand based on a closed set of examples, the encoder will work best. But now you want to generate, you want to generate answers. You want to have a more interactive experience and um, you want to kind of have an output that is similar to the language that you were talking in. That's where the decoder will work best. So like we were just talking, so say you want to implement a new task and say, let's, um, we'll use this example throughout this talk. Um, it's the summarization of trending topics in news, right? So say this is the new task we want to implement. How do we choose which one to use, the encoder or the decoder? And just examples of an encoder, BERT, decoder, GPT, um, right? So let's say this is an extractive task, right? So in the sense where you really want it to be factually correct, but you're not as concerned with the language um, structure being sound. Um, you can have repetitive and redundancies. And so um, it's not really like conveying meaning, but it's factually correct. So an example you could think of here is, um, say you have a book and you're just kind of looking to get the correct answer. So um, you, so in this case, summarization of trending topics in the news, you have a bunch of newspapers and you're looking to summarize trending topics. So what the encoder will do is, it's analogous to having these papers and just kind of highlighting the trending topics. Now, when you're highlighting, you might not always make a coherent sentence because you're not actually generating sentences. You're kind of like cutting up the newspaper and gluing it together. That's kind of how the encoder works, but it will be factually correct because it's not generating, it's just extracting. Now, if you want a task to be more abstractive where you have a pile of newspapers and you want to write the trending topics, um, but you also want it to be coherent and have a better customer um, satisfaction there. So this would be more like having a pen and paper. So you've read the newspapers and you want to summarize these trending topics. You take your pen and you just write down coherently. Um, so your sentences will be fully formed, coherent and adequate summaries, but you now add the potential of having error or possibly hallucination in them as you're not as factually correct as the encoder. So these are the kind of trade-offs you can think of when you're looking to implement your task. Now, let's start with prompt engineering, the kind of um, initial step of how you can implement a new task with an LLM. The first, um, yeah, the first idea I would always recommend is trying to see if different prompt engineering techniques work for the um for the for your task itself seeing off the shelf if you can just leverage it now there's several examples you can have zero shot you can have few shot you give it no examples just see out of the box does it work for your um news trending summarization task um if it doesn't work then give it a few examples um, so give it a few examples of how you would like a summarization to happen while also giving it the news articles. Now, in terms of few shot, the other thing that I've noticed through my research is that LLMs really like structure and they really like um, cohesiveness, which uh, inherently exists in code. So every time when we look to prompt LLMs, um, you can use structure like XML tags. So any headings you have, convert them to XML tags and the output is a lot richer and a lot more meaningful that it generates. There's also a few other methods. There's um, chain of thought. So every time you prompt your LLM, you can just add in, let's think step by step. And that seems to be, uh, that seems to work great for, um, in order to generate these outputs. There's also Cove chain of verification where the um, model will actually draft an initial response. And then what will happen is um, we ask the model to plan verification questions to fact check against the draft. Once it fact checks against the draft, then it will 
uh, kind of massage its answer um, by answering those verification questions independently, and then it will generate its final verified response. There's another technique that has come out recently, um, and they're seeing great benefits to actually giving um, LLMs a tip, kind of like a um, a positive reinforcement every time it uh, every time they ask it a question or every time the LLM generates a great response, just give it positive reinforcement in terms of complimenting it in terms of just giving it a great um, tip. It's able to perform better. We also have, of course, RAG, um, which is also actually a prompting technique. And um, this has been gaining a lot of traction recently. So just to go over RAG quickly, how it works is you can think of it in three different stages, right? There's the ingestion, retrieval, and the kind of output or synthesis um, stage. So the reason um, RAG is used, first of all, is to kind of add that fact verification layer within the LLMs to mitigate hallucination. It doesn't completely remove it, but it does help in mitigation. So what the ingestion layer takes in is the documents. So say you have your news trending topics, your documents will then be news articles. And what you want to do with these news articles is you can have different sizes, right? Um, some articles in the New York Times can be a whole page, some can be very small, so there can be different lengths. What we then want to do is divide them up into different chunks. There's a lot of chunking strategies out there. Some are static. Um, I haven't seen too many dynamic as of yet, but I think that's a where this strategy will head. But basically, um, static chunking strategies just look into breaking down um, at a fixed character length, uh, which doesn't always work great because you could be splitting up sentences at a fixed character length. Um, they also look to break down at, say, a paragraph level or um, just making sure that a full sentence is accounted for. Once you've got your chunking strategy, the one thing you want to keep in mind is having overlaps within your chunks, within your different chunks. Because what happens is if you just divide a news article, um, just like in just first paragraph, second paragraph, third paragraph, the issue is these chunks are being stored as embeddings within the um, within your vector database. And since and they won't have overlap. So you'll lose context. So what you actually want to do is have some overlap of your um, next chunk within your current chunk so that you don't lose context when you retrieve these. And basically what you'll do is you'll choose um, an embedding um, mo model. And, a, and again, you can go back to Hugging Faces uh, leaderboard, um, MTEB is called, um, to figure out which embedding model works best for your use case, which is topping the leaderboards at the moment. And then you'll use that embedding and store it within your vector database. Now, this embedding can kind of be thought as the index. You're still storing metadata. So you're still storing the actual text and you're still storing like um, date, time, author, any other metadata that's relevant for the time of retrieval. So when you do retrieval, what you're taking is the user's query. So the user is asking what's currently trending today. What you'll do is you'll take that query, you'll use the same um, embedding model that you used to chunk, and you'll do a similarity search within your vector database in order to retrieve um, either top K chunks, um, top P, however you want to do your retrieval. Um, and you'll retrieve those chunks. And actually, you're not looking so much to get the embeddings. You're more so looking to get the text and you'll feed that text into the LLM along with the initial query, and then it will generate a more cohesive response. So those are the few prompt engineering techniques that you can look at when you're looking to create your new task. Let's also briefly talk about um, context length extension. Um, now with Gemini coming in, this is not so much of an issue, but prior to that, this was definitely an issue where um, weren't able to kind of input long um, long ranges in the, within the prompt. 
Um, so there was different techniques. There's positional positional interpolation. So kind of instead of using integers um, for positions, the method uses non-integer values um, between the whole numbers uh, to be able to extend the length. And this is, again, the positional encoding that we saw within the transformer architecture. And this is actually, I believe, what Lama 2 had used, positional interpolation. There's also long LoRa, which can extend the context length during fine tuning um, by extending LoRa, which is another technique we'll look at soon for parameter efficient fine tuning, and introduces um, these shift short attention. Okay. Let's also talk about fine tuning. Now, say you've tried all of the prompt engineering techniques and they're not giving you the best results. The next step here is fine tuning. So there's two different classes of fine tuning you can look at. Um, first is of course the uh, full fine tuning. So you take the model and then you kind of further train it on your specific data set or task, and you train the entire model and update all of its weights. This is expensive, um, it's time consuming, it's costly. If possible, I would, um, and of course it comes with its own other flaws. There's catastrophic forgetting, which means that the um, LLM can forget the initial task it was trained on. You'll need a large amount of data. These models are huge. So for your new task, you'll need a large amount of data. You can overfit, compute can become an issue. Um, so what I would recommend is starting with parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. There's a different, there's I believe three different classes of parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. First one is prompt modification. So in terms of prompt modification, what you can do is um, kind of soft prompt tuning. So what you'll just do is kind of introduce these trainable parameters that are added to the model's input embeddings. Or you can do hard prompt tuning, which is simply altering the input into the LLMs. There's also prefix tuning, which adds um, trainable prefix parameters. Um, then the other uh, set of techniques are the adapters. And the adapters are basically adding modules. I think there's an echo. There we go. Um, yeah. So they're adding um, new modules called adapter modules between the layers of the pre trained network there. Um, we can see that in the image here where you see the regular transformer block. And then now you can see it with the adapters. So the adapters are kind of added between the layer norms and the fully connected layers. And the adapter layers are just simply the fully connected layers, non-linear activations, and then fully connected layers again. And then the most popular techniques that we're seeing today are the reparameterization techniques, um, more so LoRa and different flavors of LoRa. So let's just quickly talk about those. What LoRa is, it's low rank adaptation. And what that means is it takes the original models, pre-trained weights, um, and adds existing weights along with it. So it's not, it's not, co it's not extens, like it's not altering the pre-trained weights. What it's doing is it's adding low rank matrices to the existing weights. And these low rank matrices are actually what are modified when you fine tune it, when you use PEF um, to fine tune it for your new task. So you're not touching the original model's weights. So you can't have um, catastrophic forgetting because you're leaving the existing model as it is and you're just adding low rank weight matrices. Now, a more efficient um, method than that is quantized LoRa. And what quantized LoRa does is it says that since you're not modifying the original uh, model's pre-trained weights, let's quantize that, reduce its, um, so let's reduce its kind of precision and then add our um, low rank weight matrices with it. 
And then there's another add-on on top of that, which is quantized aware lowering adaptation. And what that does is it actually quantizes both the new LoRa weights as well as the original model's weights. And then um, the weights are first merged together. So the image we see here, the weights are first merged with the full precision model weights. And then they're jointly quantized um, in order to keep efficiency. What you can do though, one of the cons here is because you're losing precision, perhaps your model might not be as stable, but that's something you can evaluate and see how it's working for your task. And if it's less stable, perhaps um, vanilla LoRa might be the better option. Now, um, we're getting closer to the output here of the LLM. So in terms so of the output, um, how do you generate the next token? Right? That's what it's looking to do. All um, ChatGPT is doing is as you feed it tokens, it's looking to generate the next output and that's how it makes coherent sentences. Um, there's different <laughs> techniques that it can use. There's greedy decoding. So just use always the tokens with the highest probability. Um, the the reason the one con for that is for every person who asks the same question to chat to chat GPT you'll always get the same answer there's no variability there's no flexibility within the language there you can do exhaustive search decoding so exhaustively um, explore every combination and of course this would be um, you know the highest in terms of um, efficiency, this would lack efficiency. There's beam search, so you can explore multiple possibilities and kind of just retain the most likely one. Top K, just sample from a short list of K tokens. Um, top P, on the other hand, which is nucleus sampling, um, just set the size of the short list based on a certain threshold. So you're not specifically picking a K, you're picking more so of a threshold. And then also wanted to touch on temperature which is not exactly um, a sampling technique, but it's correlated here. So a temperature is basically a hyperparameter on the softmax, which comes at the output of the um, decoder layer. And what it does is it kind of controls the randomness. So higher you set temperature, the more randomness in the token, the lower you set your temperature hyperparameter, the more um, cohesive you'll have your um, sentences there. And just wanted to cover a few other um, relevant topics that come up in LLMs often. So one of them we had touched on briefly um, is hallucination mitigation. So this is a problem that can occur when you use your LLM for your new task. You can have hallucination. It can make up facts that are not correct. And while there is no strategy to completely eliminate it, there's a few ways we can mitigate it. So one of them is um, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, which we spoke about earlier. The other techniques we can use are have human moderators, right, in the loop, have a feedback loop. So as it's generating a response, have human, human moderators rank it have a feedback loop. For example, ChatGPT does a thumbs up, thumbs down. If the answer was great, um, thumbs up. If the answer was not great, thumbs down. And that helps them understand how relevant their output was. And of course, you can use um, RLHF where you have the human rank um, different generated responses based on what you would call alignment with human expectation, whether it's safety, honesty, harmlessness, um, whatever your um, alignment techniques are there. Also wanted to touch on um, reversal curse, which is another paper that has come out fairly recently. So what reversal curse is saying is um, LLMs that are trained on A is B kind of fail to learn B is A. So if you kind if you tell an if you train an LLM to understand that Paris is the capital of France, it may not understand that France is the capital, that France's capital is Paris. So a solution to, and this could potentially um, lead to 
maybe not hallucination, but false outputs. So because it's a failure in logical um, deduction and generalization in the LLMs. Uh, so a few solutions to this strategy is to augment your data set. So as you're looking to train your LLM on a new task, have it augmented with reversed statements. So along with the original Paris is the capital of France, make sure you also have France's capital is Paris within your data set. Um, so in the training process, the language model will then be trained on this augmented data set with the original data as well as the reverse data. And after that, it should be able to help the reversal curse relationships better. Um, yeah, and basically the method of the data augmentation um, in reversal curse essentially teaches the model this symmetry between the languages. Yeah, so just kind of wanted to um, kind of briefly cover the final thoughts and give a few moments here for any questions or um, any other discussions that you might have. So we went over um, kind of the input to the LLM, which was prompt engineering, a few different techniques there. Um, how do we actually manipulate the LLM decoder itself? We talked about PEF techniques. Um, and then the output. How does it output? And that's token sampling there. There's a lot more information available. I just wanted to share that as well. But uh, yeah, floor is open to any questions that you may have. And um, yeah, feel free to chime in. Nitwik, you will have to uh, unmute uh, if there is a question from our class. And uh, Vinija, there is just a question there on hyperparameter tuning, um, if that is relevant for LLM, and that's in the chat. Okay, sure. I'm just opening the chat now. Um, let's see, is there a place where we can regularly things happening to us? I think someone asked, is there a place where we can regularly look up um, latest trends happening towards an NLP LLM? Um, I, I tried to maintain a blog with the um, latest techniques. As I read something new, I try to update it. Other than that, um, I think there's a few other folks' blogs um, that are great to follow. There's Eugene Yang, there's uh, Chip Huyan's blogs are great. Um, Aman.ai also keeps up to date with NLP LLM techniques. So that's kind of um, how you can stay up to date. Of course, the best method is to read new papers as they come in, but that may not be scalable as there's new papers coming in every day. So those are the few things I would recommend. Um, any advice on hyperparameter tuning? Any tricks of the trade? Um, tuning strategies? I can... Um, so nothing in particular. The thing is, there's no one right answer when it comes to hyperparameter tuning. It's kind of a kind of situational basis, kind of depending on your task, depending on um, which model even you're looking to use. As um, as I work on different research projects, I see that there's not like one straightforward way to say these are the strategies to always use this value for this hyperparameter. Um, it's kind of a test and see how it works kind of situation. So no kind of um, coherent, like this is the way to do hyperparameter tuning. Um, that's kind of what I've seen as I've conducted research. Oh, sorry, quick question uh, in yeah, regards to that. Um, yeah. yeah, the reason why I ask is because, of, sorry, thank you for the answer, by the way. Um, like it, it's really nice getting that from like a researcher. Um, the reason why I kind of ask is in the past, um, so with these models becoming bigger and bigger, uh, there's yeah. more hyperparameters than there used to be. Um, it used to be just like batch size, maybe the number of layers, normalization maybe. Now it's just like there's too many parameters. And I don't really know how to, um, I guess, like vary parameters along a particular axes to get the best result. Um, and I know people have mentioned things like you know, Bayesian hyperparameter tuning, but is there like proper principled way and how to experiment with those kinds of techniques, or is it just a trial and error to see what happens? 
Um, yeah, I don't think there's a one shot answer in terms of hyperparameter tuning. I think it's mostly like test and try out what works also because it's different to have kind of that one shot answer because the um, different tasks um, are not as correlated. So I wouldn't say there's one way I would kind of say um, it's tried and test, but it's a great question. And I think I'd love to look into it and see if there is there is a one-shot answer like that. I'd definitely put out an article and um, share that publicly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, is there a way to define a threshold to determine when human intervention is deemed necessary? Um, so yeah, I agree here. There's, again, not a kind of solid answer to say, okay, at this point you need human intervention, but there's a few uh, pillars you need to check. Do you have the um, kind of cost allowance to allow human intervention? It's not always um, budget friendly. If not, there's also ways where you can add AI feedback in the loop. But generally, the way I would do it is I would check and see if my um, fine tuning or my prompting strategies are working and evaluate it against the ground truth of against what I'm looking to expect as output. And if it's very far away from what I was really looking for, then I would go towards human intervention. Um, that's the general strategy I would take, but there's no one right answer here. Okay, mm -hmm. so can we say that uh, human uh, intervention should be the last resort? If we have other ways that uh, we can use AI techniques to, you know, mitigate uh, the, the the problem, then we we don't really want to uh, involve human intervention. I would, I would not say the last resort. I would say it's kind of um, dependent on your case and your task. If you are able to use multiple te techniques. That's the best situation and scenario here, where if you don't have to be limited to just human, to just drag, to just um, AI feedback, right? If you are able to use as many techniques, you kind of you kind of even reduce your chances of hallucination even more. If you have a budget constraint and um, you are more able to use RAG and keep that keep your vector database up to date, would say all of the news articles that are coming in regularly, then maybe that's the way to go. But maybe if you have enough um, folks who are able to do the human intervention, then perhaps that's the way to go. So I would kind of see more situational based in that sense. Not one technique is trumping the others. Um, having all of them even would, works. Yeah. Yeah, I would give a more broader answer in the uh, sense that there are, let's say, uh, uh, chatbots where you know you interact and get answers and LLMs are extensively used for that. But then there are other classes of systems, say copilot and agents. So the copilot, um, you know, you explicitly uh, 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 assume or, or you explicitly say that uh, AI and um, humans are uh, have to collaborate and have to work. Um, because there are problems that uh, AI alone cannot solve or uh, LLM alone cannot solve or should not solve. Example, maybe at least for the next few years, some of the healthcare problems where um, you do not want, uh, you know, uh, you don't have enough safety or explainability or various other uh, things that are necessary for that domain. And um, uh, you want to make sure that uh, human uh, expert is involved in the process and yet, lot of things from learning, uh, learning from data, let's say patients pass historical data can be done by an AI model. So now, you know, uh, there are a uh, class of applications where you do not see, um, you know, an AI model solving all the problem. You say, well, they will be uh, helping solve the problem. Yeah, does that answer your yeah, question? So it may still be useful if there is some way to determine uh, like uh, what I asked, uh, some some kind of threshold that uh, we determine that uh, humans should uh, uh, look into it to determine whether there is something wrong. Because uh, yes. as, as we can imagine, there could be cases in which 
even if you apply, you know, a combination of AI techniques, but uh, all of them got uh, uh, confused or even fooled by some some attack, and then they, although they they well might try to mitigate the problem, but uh, they might uh, fall into some kind of a uh, loop and uh, they they stay in the state of confusion. So perhaps this if there is some way to determine well uh when humans should really look into it that that could be helpful I think yeah. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. Um we shouldn't discount human error that can happen as well so it's not foolproof as well. Um, you mentioned there could be attacks, perhaps in your RAG technique, your database gets corrupted. It's very valid. Um, but the way I see it is not definitely having humans in the loop would absolutely help. Um, we could have a few human errors there as well. But yeah, I, I agree that if there was a specific way to say, OK, at this level of hallucination, um, you should employ human evaluators. That would definitely be a great point and a having that threshold would be great. But as far as I know, I don't think any threshold like that exists, but that would be a great area of open research. Yeah, and I think the next one is- um, the, On the um, same, so, yeah, on the same topic, um, is there somehow a measure of the level of hallucination right now on LLM? So does the LLM knows if it's dreaming of electric ship or not? So the one easiest measure is comparing it against your ground truth and your facts, right? Um, checking just checking like uh, basic facts that you have, the president, the current president, um, any kind of kind of giving it data that can easily be verified against. That's one way to fully check for hallucination. No, no, I'm saying if the LLM knows. Not if we can tag, if the LLM knows. If if, if the, the LLM system is... can, can can have a measure of how much of the data are hallucinated and how much is not. I think if we had that check, then it would be very easy to control hallucination. So the system, uh, uh, ChatGPT and Llama, there's no way for them to know that this is not factually correct. Um, so they've also been, you know, trained with uh, RLHF for helpfulness, harmlessness, safety. Um, so they're not inherently trying to fool humans. They're not inherently trying to give counterfactual information. It's kind of a like a task, like a side effect of um, having generative models where it's looking to all it's really looking to do is it's just looking to generate the next token on, and just trying to statistically predict which word should come next based on the prior context that it has. So it has no malice in that sense where it's trying to um, hallucinate on purpose and it doesn't have a ability to know that it's trying to hallucinate on purpose or how much hallucination versus factual is happening. Um, all right, so yeah, so spoke about many limitations in the LLMs. Um, LLMs have advances in which we will solve, you know, algorithms that are handling input data. I believe Dr. Shade also, yes, yeah, Dr. Shade looked to answer this one. Uh, can we, yes, I can definitely give a copy of this presentation. I believe Dr. Shade is also recording it. So there'll also be a video recording. Um, yeah, perfect. Any other um questions just on the call or on the chat anywhere? Um, excuse me. Um, there is Kaushik Roy's question which had to be addressed. Uh, could you? You need to come here and speak. Any thoughts on uh, evaluation and if uh, evaluation of LLM? are sufficient to test the breadth of task complexity in the setting that they are deployed in. Sure. So if you think of the general LLMs that you have, they're not specifically, so they're not domain specific, right? Um, okay. Let's look at the example we've been talking about so far. 
if you look at GPT, it's not specifically made for a specific domain, not, not for healthcare, not for education. It's made for general application. You can use it for code. You can use it for um, education. You can use it in lieu of searching Google for your quick query question. So in terms of that, having a specific benchmark not as easy. Having multiple benchmarks is much more plausible, but when you get into more domain specific areas, when you get into more, say, medical domains and um, educational domains, having an evaluation there is a lot easy as you have rich data to compare it against, to compare ground tooth against. So even if you have, say, um, multimodal data, where you're feeding it images as well as text as input. And um, you're looking for it to kind of say, evaluate and diagnose a disease. Having that ground truth already there is a lot easier in terms of evaluation. And I think in terms of even as we conduct research, doing evaluation and creating benchmarks there is a lot easier than for a general class of um, generic kind of LLMs of that kind of makes sense. So as you create your own applications, I would kind of gear your evaluation based on the tasks and your expected outputs. Um, and the I guess the kind of nice thing is as you're creating your own um, task specific LLM, you don't like the you you're not really looking for it to do well on all of the areas it was pre trained on. You're just looking for it to do well on the specific task you need it to perform well on. And evaluation for that and creating benchmarks for that is a lot easier and a lot um, plausible, if that kind of helps answer your question. Yeah. Just one question from my side is that, so with the recent release of Google Gemini uh, with the 1 million contacts, uh, uh, window so you see that the industry term is like a rag is kind of uh, nearing yeah. its end, end of life um yeah. so where do you, how do you see this and then also we need to bring in that cost parameter how is it going to be the cost implications instead of you know putting it into a document and vectorizing vectorizing it or putting everything into a, that context window that will also have a cost implications right we'll elaborate on that yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. So um, you're very correct about how with the larger context length with Gemini, now you don't necessarily need a RAG pipeline like you did earlier. Um, and that's very valid. There were earlier cases when this had happened. Um, I believe Claude by Anthropic also had a large context, but there was a paper that had come out earlier. It was, a, it was lost in the middle where when you give LLM's context, it really focuses on the um, initial context. It loses context in the middle, and then it focuses on the end. There's a lot of tests to kind of determine that. There's a needle in the haystack test, which you can implement to help determine that. And what that will do is they'll put random um, kind of a random sentences within your context, and you'll kind of have the LLM reproduce that within the output to check which part of the context it's paying most attention to. Now, I don't think that exists in Gemini currently, and it's very impressive um, the way they've done that. So you're correct. If we if further models we have, um, if they're able to recreate this context length, and if they're not able to lose information within this large context and they're able to absorb all of it together, then I don't really see a need for external knowledge sources, um, but I think that's like, it's too early to say perhaps just now. Um, let's have a few more models come in. Let's have more evaluation done on Gemini. Let's see how it performs um, and then kind of figure out whether, whether we need external knowledge sources. But yeah, if we go down this route, I agree. I don't think we have the requirement. So a quick question on that. Um, yeah, so like RAG is like pretty impressive in what it does to like, you know, retriever and generator. 
So do you see it that's do you see that it's like still gonna be around uh for a while? Because it seems like the kind of application that's good for like a company, like an internal company of some kind. Because I don't really know if employees are just gonna, you know, take documents and copy and paste it some text window or Syria. Um so do you see like would you say that RAG is still gonna be around for a little bit of time? Or is there gonna be a point where because of longer context links, RAG is never gonna be like, you know, popularized after a while? Yeah, I would um, actually, that's a great question too. So it would have to be kind of company specific as well. Like would Amazon really want to leverage? Um, I, you know, that's not something I can really speak on and say, I'm not sure. Um, but if internally each company had their own LLMs with larger context, perhaps they could just switch to leveraging that. Perhaps they can make their software pipeline worth every time they give um, their documents as inputs to the LLM and then have it generate output, I can see how that can be convenient rather than maintaining a vector database and keeping it updated, um, leveraging embedding models in order to store it within the vector database and then retrieving it could become a costly pipeline, especially if your documents are rotating very quickly. On the other hand, um, say you kind of, don't have regular updates needed, you have an infrastructure already built, um, you have kind of a smooth flowing pipeline, there's no need to shake it up immediately if your end goal is just to serve an answer to a customer and your end goal is not really to check if um, you're leveraging the state of the art within your current pipeline. So I think those are the trade-offs companies will think about when choosing which one to use, but I can't really speak on behalf of them, but that's the general idea I'm thinking of. Is it more, well, it's kind of hard to ask this question because like um, each company has their own like demands, their own constraints and their own budget. Um, is it harder to continuously fine tune models? Because I also know that like, um, if you're training your data, so like for, for example, with ChatGPT, like it's trained on like a pretty big chunk of the internet and more information that we don't really know about. Um, but the data is going to be changing over time, right? Just that's just mm -hmm. how data works, especially mm -hmm. when you're um, dealing with like an online system. So, is it harder to continuously fine tune models and to continuously EB test these models versus having a RAG pipeline? Like, what do you like what, in your professional opinion? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, it depends on how large your model is. Do you really want to constantly update its weights and then kind of evaluate it? again and again to make sure it hasn't forgotten, it, you're not going through catastrophic forgetting, which can't always, not always easy to see. Um, there's also sometimes fine tuning introduces new complexities that are just hard to explain. Um, when we had tried to add a different language onto a model that we were looking to fine tune, it had kind of shifted and kind of started to talk in both the prior language, it was, formally um, using and then the new language that we had fine-tuned it on and it's very erratic behavior. Um, handling that and handling different problems that can occur, I believe, is more difficult than just updating a external da data source. I would also look into seeing how frequent you have this happening, right? Can you just, if, if it's news, it's coming in daily, do you want to fine tune your model every hour? Likely not, um, when are you gonna use it? And once you fine tune it, you have to evaluate it. Um, it can you know, take quite a long time versus just updating an external knowledge source and it'll just check and it'll see, um, do I have information about this current news that they're asking for um, and try to retrieve it and say perhaps that you update your external knowledge source every hour or so and it doesn't exactly have that, it can look in, see that it doesn't have anything and just respond with, I don't know an answer just yet. Um, and maybe in the next hour, once it's updated, it can say, this is the answer. Versus fine tuning you now requires evaluation um, and requires a lot more, it's just also checking your business logic and business rules and it's adhering to all of the requirements before you can have it customer facing. So. And also, if your model is really large, perhaps that's not really something you want to do. So um, in that sense, I would really uh, gear towards RAG. I think the I think the analogy that people use is um, if it's a closed book task, 
where um, you only need to answer from this one book, then fine tuning is a better option. It always gives better results um, because you're actually teaching the model all of the answers from the book. You're actually spending time and teaching the model this entire book. Whereas RAC can be thought of as like um, a teacher there just giving, like you're in an exam and you have an open book there and you're able to look through the book to find the answer for the question in your exam, but you don't actually know it yourself. So if you have information that's coming in too quickly, perhaps that open book concept is a better option, but if you only need this one book and all of your answers are in this one book, then let's just teach the model the entirety of the book. Yeah. Have there been approaches to like hybridize these things? I mean, this is just me thinking out loud. I don't even know if it's really required, um, but have there been mm -hmm. approaches or papers that you've seen where people have tried to combine kind of the best of both worlds, uh, almost like an extractor and then like, um, you know, like some other module on top of that? Yeah, yeah, there's this paper you should look at. It's called Raft. It just came out. It actually does that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wonderful discussion. Um, students, uh, you know, we are, I think class time is complete. So students are uh, welcome to leave. And, um, you know, all the rest of the group members know Vinija, so feel free to connect with her. Vinija, clearly your talk um, um, attracted quite a bit of interest. A lot of people even from outside joined today. So credit to um, <laughs> what you're bringing to the table. Um, we'll be in connect, uh, we will connect with you uh, further. And uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. It was great chatting. Thank you. Bye.